Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Robert Young, Maureen O'Hara, and Walter Slavejack in The Fallen Sparrow. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Deep in the heart of most of us, there must be a suppressed longing to emulate Sherlock Holmes and the other masters of his profession. How else can you explain the appeal of the mystery story to farmer and financier, haberdasher and housewife, chorus girl or clergyman? A shiver running down the spine is no respecter of persons, and I, for one, look forward with gusto to these manhunting excursions. Tonight we have one of the best, RKO's object lesson in suspense, The Fallen Sparrow. And our guides on this trail of intrigue, romance, and murder are Robert Young, Maureen O'Hara, and Walter Slezak. Bob Young has just returned to Hollywood after a tour of army hospitals. RKO provided Maureen O'Hara and Walter Slezak, both of whom starred in the film production of The Fallen Sparrow. It takes all kinds of people to make a world and all kinds of plays to make a theater. But I think this play will please young and old alike. Those who've just tried Lux Flakes and those who've been using it for years. We had a letter last week from a woman who, at 62, is doing her bit in a war plant in Chicago. She says she first started buying Lux in a little textile town in Lancashire, England, about 1901. Since then, she's used our product in Switzerland and Canada and for the last 25 years in the United States. She wonders if anyone else beats her record of 43 years in four countries. I can't answer for that, but, but she might, must be mighty sure about Lux Flakes by this time. And this time is curtain time for Dorothy Hughes' mystery thriller, The Fallen Sparrow, starring Robert Young as Kit, Maureen O'Hara as Elma Doan, and Walter Slezak as Dr. Scarfs. In a world at war, many sparrows must fall. In 1940, long after the fascist... In 1940, long after the fascist victory, which ended the war in Spain, an American volunteer returned to New York. His name is John McKittrick. He had fought in the Loyalist Army, and after its defeat, spent two years in the horrors of a Spanish prison. Then he escaped. Broken in body and spirit, John McKittrick goes to Arizona. And there, on a ranch, slowly is forgetting the nightmare of the war and his imprisonment. One day he runs across an old newspaper. And what he reads in that paper sends him rushing back to New York, to police headquarters and the office of Inspector Tobin. Inspector Tobin? Yeah? Head of homicide? That's right. Why did you give out that Lieutenant Lepetino was accidentally killed? Because his death was accidental. Who are you, Mr. My name is John McKittrick. Oh, yeah. Old Chris's boy. Yeah, he used to work with your father in the old East Side days. Yeah, he came into a lot of money after Chris died. Uh, my mother married again. The man she married happened to be pretty wealthy. After she died, it came to me. Any objections? Don't misunderstand, sir. All right, I came here to find out about Louis. Friend of yours? Since we were kids... Louie's been dead for weeks, aren't you? A little late? Well, I've been on a ranch in Arizona taking a rest. I, you were in Spain, I, weren't you? Heard you enlisted in that loyalist army or something. Well, I didn't know about Louie until I read about it in a month-old newspaper. I caught the first train east. Mm -hmm. You know that Louie didn't kill himself. I didn't say that. I said it was an accident. Louie was a policeman, a detective lieutenant, one of the toughest cops on your force, and he falls out of a window. I knew Louie. And maybe you know more than the whole homicide squad. Uh, now, listen. You can play cowboy in Arizona as long as you want to, but you're not going to play detective around here even if your name is McKittrick. So run along and forget it. Louie was murdered. I'm going to find out who did it and why you're covering up. Run along, son. By the way, when I was getting off the train, a girl bumped into me. She apologized and went away. That was nice of her. Yeah. But riding here in the cab, I found this in my pocket. That girl had planted it on me. What is it? Louie Lepetino's wallet. There were two things in it. 
Louis's badge and a letter I'd sent him from Spain. Hand it over. I think maybe Louis's mother might like to have the badge. I'm going over to see her now. I'll see that she gets it. Where's the letter? I tore it up. Goodbye, Inspector. Goodbye. Oh, one thing more. I saw Louis when I got back from Spain. He got me a permit to carry this. A gun. Permit's good for a year. Why do you want to carry a gun? To shoot people with, sweetheart. <laughs> We knew you would come, Kit. We have been waiting. Always before, when our Louis was a boy, when he was in trouble, you would come. Now, now we won't ever see him again. Louis. Mama, please, please, Mama. Kit, you found out how to get? Not yet, but I will find out. I know it was not an accident. No, no accident. You got any ideas, Papa? No. We no see Louis very much for a long time. He's a... Going around with these people. What people? Very swell people. I heard him talk about uh, Ab Parker and a girl called Darby Tabaton. Oh, sure. Uh, Ab Parker's one of my best friends, a lawyer. Darby Tabaton's a girl I used to go with. I introduced Louis to them long ago. Kit, we cannot bring Louis back. Maybe it is better if you do nothing. Listen, Mama. When I was in prison, I managed to write Louis a letter. They'd been torturing me, beating me until I thought I was going crazy. Tortured it? Why did they do that? Because I have something the Nazis want. I begged Louis to let me escape, help me escape. How he could help me, I didn't know, but he did. Louis got me out of that prison. Now he's dead. No, I can't just let it go at that. I'm going to find out. Yes, kid. Mama, you remember when I was in Spain, I sent Louis a souvenir, some seashells? Yes, seashells, so pretty. You still have them? Sure. Louis says you could put the seashells away and keep it. Good, I may want to look at them soon. Kit, you stay on and have supper. Well, thanks, but I can't. I told Ab Parker I'd drop in. I'll see you in a couple of days. Arrivederci. Arrivederci, Kit. Mr. McKittrick, how good to see you again, Robert. Go right in, sir. Kit, is that you? Hi, Ab. Gee, this is really great. Well, I figured I had enough of Arizona. Ab, do uh, you mind if I bunk with you a couple of days? Oh, I can have the whole place to yourself. I'm going to Washington late tonight. Well, how are you anyway? Fine. Scars all healed. Eat well, sleep well. Hands steady as a rock. No more hearing things? No. Say, uh, you going out? Yeah, to Bobby Taverton. She's giving a dinner for some refugees. <laughs> That's her latest craze. We're all meeting at her place and then going to dinner. Come along. Sure, why not? A kid... Bob is the real reason why you came rushing back to New York, didn't she? No, not exactly. Was it because of uh, Louis Lepetina? What do you know about it, Ab? Oh, nothing much. Bobby has a party and Louis falls from the top floor window. That's the way they tell it. Who? You'll meet most of them tonight. Kit, Louis got you out of Spain, didn't he? How did you know that? Well, just guess. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I can talk now. It's pretty tough, Ab. First, you don't think you can take it. And then you do. It's like somebody shoved you in a bottle and jammed in the cork. You get to know everything with the sounds they make. Sometimes screams. Some of the other prisoners. Key turning in a lock. Squeaky hinge. Water dripping in the hall. That's bad business because we don't get much to drink. It's good to know what the sounds mean. Except when you know it's too long between times. And you just wait for the drag of that foot. The man who limps. When you hear that, you know they're ready to beat you again and do their, their little tricks. You tell them it's too soon. One more beating and you'll die, and they don't want you to die. I couldn't take any more. They couldn't let me die, and I couldn't take any more. I had to tell, but I didn't. I didn't. Now, kid, take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, how am I doing? I'm sorry, kid. I, I shouldn't have asked. I tell you, I've licked it. And Louis was the one that got you out? Yeah. Louis Lepetino. Uh, is that my room? Yes, uh, I'll tell Robert to bring in the bag. Well, I'd better clean up now for the dinner. Thank you. Kit, darling. Hello, Bobby. Darling, you look wonderful. Thanks, you do too. Well, why all the reserves? <laughs> too many people. I'll see you later. Remember me? Hello, Ab. Now, come on, you two. There are some people I want you to meet. We were just talking about you. Some really wonderful people. Oh? In here. Well, here they are, Doctor. 
Dr. Scott, may I present John McKittrick and Ab Parker. How, How do you do? How do you do? This is the doctor's nephew, Otto Scott. Gentlemen. Oh. You will excuse me for not rising. I have been confined to this wheelchair for years. Mr. McKittrick, Miss Taverton was telling me you fought in Spain. I was there for a while. I'm very interested. You see, I'm engaged in a work having to do with the cruelties of men towards other men. A large subject, Doctor. Yeah. And your observations would be invaluable. Could an old invalid impose on you to visit him someday? If you think I could be of any use, sure. Before you came in, I was frightening Miss Taverton and Otto, comparing modern scientific torture with the methods of the ancients. Among the ancients, only the Asiatic displayed any real cunning. They combined mental agony with the purely physical and gave us the principle of all modern torture. The victim is saved at the borderline of insanity. Then, ah, then comes an interval in which he tortures himself. He waits, knowing the physical torture will be repeated. And it is repeated, most assuredly, with perhaps a few new variations. You see the point? Ghastly. Oh, I could tell you many more equally ingenious techniques. Sorry, Bobby, but it's after nine. So it is. Well, I suppose we really should be on our way, Doctor. Uh, just where are we going? To the refugee dinner, of course. Ed can tell you all about it on the way over. Say, Ab, just who are these gossips? Well, the doctor's a famous Norwegian historian. He got out just before the Nazis moved in. And the blonde wolf with him? Otto, his particular interest is Barbie. All I know is that he and the doctor are both friends of the prince, Francois de Namur. The prince? Yeah, they live with him. The prince is great stuff for the refugees. <laughs> Don't worry about old Scott. He's been pretty thoroughly checked. And the nephew? Well, Otto's accepted on his uncle's word. Do you believe all this? Do you mind if I don't? <laughs> I see. Ab, uh, were the Scotts at the party when Louis had his accident? Yeah. Now, look, kid, if you want to know about the Scotts, talk to Whitney. Whitney? Sure, you remember, my cousin. Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. She'll be there tonight. She sings. Oh? <laughs> Quite a gal, Whitney. Quite a gal. So many new faces, Barbie. Tell me, uh, the girl who sang a minute ago, is that really Whitney? Oh, she's a big girl now. Sings professionally at the Club 50. Club 50, huh? And, uh... Who's that girl? The one talking to Otto over there. Well, that's the prince's granddaughter, Elma Dodd. Prince Francois de Namur? How did you know? Oh, I get around fast. You've a roving eye, kid. Kit, what's the matter? What do you mean? You seem so indifferent to me. I just can't make you out. You're spoiled, Bobby. And me? Well, when I came back from Spain and you saw me in the hospital, I figured I got the brush off. Oh, you look so awful, kid. I know. Kit. Otto and I and some others are going up to Franconia Lodge for some skiing. Please come along. No, thanks. Oh, kid, please. I can't, Barbie. I'd like to say hello to Whitney. Be a good girl and don't be sore. Go ahead. Hope you have a miserable time. <laughs> well, kid, if you insist. It is a little more private here on the terrace, but... But not enough. What would happen if we leave here? Let's go and find out. Where? I'm a stranger in town. Well, I have to be at the club by midnight. Let's go there. Swell. Suppose Ab would join us? Ab's a working man. He's going to Washington tonight. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Well, let's get going, huh? So, this is where you work. Like it? I always did. Oh, you know the place. Yeah, your boss is the brother of a friend of mine. Jake Lepatino? Mm-hmm. Waiter. Yes, sir? Whitney? Nothing, thanks. <laughs> She'll have a nothing, thanks, and I'll have a brandy. Yes, sir. <clears throat> What's Ab doing in Washington, Whitney? Well, didn't he tell you? He's working for the government, decoding. But as far as the Scotches are concerned, he's strictly on his own, I think. Who's Otto Scots? Could be a spy. And Dr. Scots? Could be another. What makes you think so? Oh, I'm smart. I can smell phony. What do you know about Louis Lepatino? I don't know what happened. Only one person saw him fall, Elma Dunn. I seem to be full of questions. Who is Elma Don? That girl you were staring at when she was talking to Otto. Mm. I saw you. She's the granddaughter of the Prince de Namur. She's the manager of a hat shop. Very swank. Uh, well, now go ahead and put it all together for me. Well, it was one of Barbie's big parties, and everyone was in the playroom upstairs. Anton and I were doing a number. Another new name. Anton? 
Oh, he's my accompanist. Saw him tonight when I sang. Oh, yeah, a good-looking guy. Quite. Well, go on. Who else was in the playroom? Brandy, sir. Thank you. Well, Barbie, of course, and the doctor, and Otto Scott, and Elma Dunn. I just finished a song when Elma said she felt faint. She went to the library. Just in time to see Louis fall or jump from the window. Where were the Scosses at that moment? Well, Dr. Scoss was in his wheelchair right next to me. Otto had gone to his room. Someone had spilled some wine on his shirt and he'd gone to change. Mm -hmm. Perfect alibi. What about the prince? Oh, he wasn't there. He's quite old and not too well. He never goes out. Whitney, how do you know so much about these people? From Anton. And where does he fit in? Oh, he doesn't. He's just a good musician who happens to know the prince and Elma Don. Let him alone, kid. Why? Stick to Elma Don. Well, I've got to change now. Will I see you after the show? Oh, but I'll call you. Thanks a lot. Good night, kid. Good night. Waiter. Yes, sir? Tell Jake Lepatino I'd like to see him. Yes, sir. Hello, McKittrick. Hello, Jake. I didn't hear about Louie for a month. I was over to see your folks this afternoon. Mm-hmm. You, uh, your health is regained? Yeah. Who got Louie? I don't know, Kit. But it was no grudge. It was no bum. That much I find out. The brother liked women, Jake. Beautiful women. Yeah, that's true. He wouldn't jump out of a window. Somebody pushed Louie out and it had to be a dame. Yeah. How did Louie get mixed up in society? I don't know. Does, uh... Elma Don come around here? But I know so few by name. Bobby Tabington comes here. That makes two beautiful dames. Elma Don and Barbie. Where'd that pianist come from? Uh, Anton? Whitney brought him in. Whitney? <laughs> Maybe there are three dames, Jake. Miss McKittrick, you going to see this thing through? Yeah, Jake, I'm going to see it through. Thanks. Well, I'll see you in a day or two, Jake. If there's anything you need... Anything. I know, thanks. So long. So long, McKittrick. Danny. Yeah? That guy just gone out. He's John McKittrick. Oh. Don't let him get out of your sight. Understand? Oh. Sure, Jake. Sure. <laughs> After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Robert Young, Maureen O'Hara, and Walter Slezak in Act Two of The Fallen Sparrow. Now, here's a friend of ours. What's that box under your arm, Libby? That's my question box. I've been eavesdropping in department stores to find out what women want to know about stockings. I was surprised how often the same questions were asked. Just pick one out and I'll answer it. Okay. How long will rayon stockings last? <laughs> how long is a piece of string? Seriously, that depends on the wear they get and the care they get. They'll probably last as long as silk if you treat them properly. You can cut down runs, double stocking wear with luck. How often should stockings be washed? There's only one answer to that. After every single wearing. Nightly luxing removes perspiration that injures fibers. Helps rayons fit better, too. Is rayon ready to wear when it feels dry? Not necessarily. Go by the clock, not the feel. Always allow 24 to 48 hours, the maximum time in damp or humid weather. Rayon dries from the outside in, so it may feel dry, but if the inner core is still damp, the threads may give way under strain, pop a run. I'm afraid that's all we'll have time for tonight, Libby. But the answers to most stocking problems add up to this. You can double the wear with nightly luxing. Actual strain tests proved it. Stockings washed with lux flakes didn't go into runs nearly so quickly as those rubbed with cake soap or washed with a strong soap. So save your precious stockings with Lux Flakes. When you whisk up Lux Suds, use all you need for a rich lather, but don't pour out more than you need. Soap contains vital war materials. Don't waste it, please. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Fallen Sparrow, starring Robert Young as Kit, Maureen O'Hara as Elma, and Walter Slezak as Dr. Scuss. Kit has walked from the Club 50 to Ab Parker's apartment. A hundred wild thoughts racing through his mind. The wounds on his body are mended, but the wounds on his mind are slow to heal. As he reaches the door, the two years of torture in prison 
start closing in on him like a huge black tidal wave. Robert! 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 Good evening, sir. Robert, didn't you hear... Who are you? I'm Ruman, sir. I'm huh? substituting for Robert, sir. Oh. Mr. Parker said he could have a few days off. I thought he told you, sir. No. No, no, he didn't. Excuse me, sir. Are you feeling ill? Your face, it's, uh, it's wet. No, I, uh, it's been running. I, it helps me sleep better. I've unpacked one bag for you, sir. I could not in the other. It was locked. Well, thanks. Good night. Good night, sir. Sure, it was locked, but that didn't stop him, did it? The lining's cut with a razor blade and then glued back, with the glue still wet. <laughs> what do they think I am, a fool? Do they think I'm crazy? Huh? Oh, God, don't let it happen. Please. Please. I'm well. I'm away from there. They can't do anything. They can't. someone. I was just coming to see if you were all right. There's nothing wrong with me. It was someone else. I'm sure you must be mistaken, sir. Perhaps you were dreaming. Yeah, dream. Wait a minute. Water. There's water dripping. I can still hear it. I can hear it. Why, yes, sir. It's the faucet in the kitchen. I must have neglected to turn it completely off. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, go to bed. I'll fix it. Sorry I woke you. Good night, sir. Good night. Oh, good morning. Good morning, Miss Dawn. I want to see some hats. Ladies' hats? Why not? It's a hat shop, isn't it? Oh, yes, of course. I like to look at ladies' hats. Well, where are they? Or do they come out on the hour like a cuckoo clock? Our trade is mostly custom, sir. Oh, well, my name is McKittrick, John McKittrick. I saw you last night at the refugee affair, Miss Don. I thought you were the most beautiful woman in the room. Well, what type of hat are you interested in, sir? Well, it doesn't matter. What time do you go to lunch? I don't go to lunch. I uh, saw you another place yesterday. You did? Yes, on the train. You bumped into me. I figured if we keep running into each other like this, we may as well know each other. Now, about lunch... I do what... not go out to lunch. Good morning. But if you don't, how can I get to know you? You and Prince Francois. You can read about the prince in any pub public library. But I can't about you. Is he, uh, really your grandfather? Of course. I doubt it. What about lunch? I told you. Then what about hats? Come on, show me a hat. Hmm, not bad. Not bad at all. You better show me something else. You've been here over an hour, Mr. McKittrick. I've shown you 14 hats. Well, and I'm I... just naturally a very patient guy. Take your time, trot out a few more. You don't really want to see hats. I really want to go to lunch. I won't go with you. Okay, let's see some more skimmers, babe. And don't dare call me babe. Look, if you don't eat lunch, you'll need a big dinner. You can't starve. I intend to eat dinner. With me? If I say yes, will you go? It's a deal. All right. Call me here later today. We'll, we'll arrange things then. <laughs> Come in. I ought to push your teeth right down your throat. Even as a kid, you were a liar, wasn't he? What are you talking about? You got a drink? In there. Give me that stuff about Alma Don. I just came from her shop. How could she heave a guy like Louie out of a window? I didn't say she could or did. What is it? Are you trying to get her in trouble? Is she giving you competition with Anton? Get out of here. Oh, so Anton is something more to you than just an accompanist. Kid, what's the matter with you? 
Yeah, it had to be a dame. But not Elma. Oh, for heaven's sakes, now it's you. You look into a pair of baby eyes and start drooling. Mm, Anton goes for it too, huh? I told you you can get out of here if you're going to talk that way. Where did you meet Anton? Where does anyone meet anyone? I'm a singer, he's a musician. How does he happen to know the Scossers? In Europe, I suppose. I don't know everything. There are a few things you'll have to find out yourself. Long distance, this is Plaza 32099. I'd like to speak to Mr. Ab Parker in Washington, D.C., Jefferson Park Hotel. Yeah, that's right, thanks. Uh, mind if I use your phone, Whitney? Help yourself. Look, I have to go to a rehearsal. Here's the key. When you're through here, drop it in the mailbox. Goodbye. Hello? Oh, well, no, never mind. Cancel the call. No. No! Maybe it's in hall. Take another drink. Something's got to work. The whiskey's the answer. Told me if your hands were steady as a rock. Come on, buck up. What are you afraid of? You've got a gun. You're in New York. Millions of people around you. You've got to find out who killed Louis. That's what you're here for, isn't it? Well, then stop shaking because you hear a sound that isn't there. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah, it's better. Much better. Kit, Kit, are you in there? Yeah, uh, just a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, Whitney. I guess I fell asleep. Couldn't sleep last night. I. Oh, goodbye, Whitney. I did not know you had company. I'll see you at the club. Bye, Anton. Well, that's just lovely. Anton must have a beautiful picture of me. I said I was sorry. Would you care to leave now? Pretty soon. Anton lives here too, huh? This is an apartment house. He lives downstairs. Why didn't you tell me that before? You didn't ask me. I'm sorry, but I've got to know these things. When did he arrive in this country, Anton? About a year ago. 1939? Yes. Whitney, you happen to know a man who limps, who drags one foot when he walks? I thought I heard him last night. I thought I heard him today, here. I'm looking for him. You know anyone like that, Whitney? No. Kid, are you sure you heard him? I don't know. Did you ever guess why I was held a prisoner in Spain for more than two years after the war was over? Did you ever wonder why I was so important? Ab did. We all tried to guess, but no one knew. Louis Lepetino knew. He helped me escape through some old country relatives he had. That's why he was killed. The greatest guy I ever knew. You understand that? Yes, Kit. They want something I've got. That's why with a man with a bad foot is here. Because I'm here. Well, who, who is he? I don't know, Whitney. He used to fly in from Berlin. I'd hear him in the corridor, and after every visit, they'd go to work on me all over again. Listen. What? Do you hear it? Do you hear anything? No, nothing. The drag, the drag of a foot. Well, listen to me, Kit. If you don't stop hearing things, you'll... Look. Hadn't you better see your doctor? I did. He said I needed rest and freedom from anxiety. You've been pretty patient, Whitney. Well, I've got a date. I'll be seeing you. Good evening, Mr. McKittrick. Come in. I can't believe it. What? Uh, keeping your word. I can't resist roses. You sent three dozen. Oh, it's a peace offering. Never. They're just a starter. We'll have dinner, see a show, go dancing, the work. You ready? Yes. Oh, uh, but when you phoned, you said you'd like to meet Prince Francois. That still goes, may I? For a moment. I'm afraid he's in rather a bad mood. He's quite old. Please be careful not to anger him. Funny grabbers, tradesmen. Just consider the state of the world. Your Highness, may I present Mr. McKittrick? I'm on it, sir. And you already know Dr. Scott. Yes. Good evening, sir. Just who are you, young man? No one in particular, sir. A man of exceptional merit, I should say. A fighting man, your highness. A fighting man? Then look. Look at that wall back there, Mr. McKittrick. What do you see? I see flags, sir. They are the standards of the house of St. Louis. My house, monsieur, 
something you cannot buy or steal, something to fight for. They represent the glory of a hundred generations anointed to rule. Uh, Elma, we have the wine. It's ready, Grandfather. Anton has it inside. Come, then. Elma, if you please. My dear, this cursed wheelchair. Of course. Did I hear you say Anton? He's a musician. I think you saw him at the dinner. I seem to see him everywhere. This talk of flags and standards may be difficult for an American to understand, Mr. McKittrick. Not for me, Doctor. You see, Your Highness, as I said, a man of exceptional merit. We are ready, Anton. I hope you will find the wine at the right temperature, Your Highness. Anton, you know Mr. McKittrick. Yes, sir. We have met. Look at the tray, sir. Observe the goblets. Are they not beautiful? Notice they are frescoed with a small gold medallion. Yes, the uh, Lion of San Rafael, isn't it? Elma, perhaps you will tell your guests something of these goblets? Oh, they, uh, they originated in Spain, Mr. McKittrick. They later came to Italy and into the possession of our house. Yes, in his highness' veins flows the same blood as the Borgias. Well, in this... Goblet may have held poison in its time. Undoubtedly. Uh, we will drink, Mr. McKittrick. Why do you switch glasses? Uh, it's an old Borgia custom, Doctor. <laughs> to be sure. Now, may I suggest we drink to... To, uh, America, Doctor? Yes, to America. And so I work at the hat shop and make my home there with my grandfather. What do you think of him? Interesting. Not nearly as interesting as you. Dan? Uh, later. Kit, what is it you really want of me? At the refugee dinner, you stared at me, and it wasn't the way a man stares at a woman. You went out of your way to find out who I am and where I work. You didn't invite me out tonight because you had nothing else to do. What is it? Yes, I invited you out. And did you accept because you wanted to, or because you were told to come? Told to? Yeah. What kind of a girl are you? Was Louis Lepetino in love with you? I knew him only for a short while. Well, that means nothing. Louis always fell in love easily. He was kind to me. So you pushed him out of a window? No, no, that's not true. I, I think you'd better take me home. It's too early. No, please. You can't make a scene here. Think of the prince. Think of those hundred generations. I, I simply don't understand you. At times, you seem to be a gentleman, and at other times, you're a... Mug. I was raised that way. I was a mug until I was 14, and they made me a gentleman. Then some of the boys made me a mug again. Why are you doing this to me, Kit? I don't know. Yes, it would be so easy to fall in love with you. Kit, I'm with you tonight because I want to be. Because in the shop, even through your insolence, I felt... I know. You didn't let me finish. You don't have to. Where did you get Louis's wallet? He gave it to me. No, not that night. He, he had shown me a picture of the two of you. He forgot it when he left. <laughs> Lady, that's a honey. You don't have to believe it. You dropped it in my pocket on the train, didn't you? Yes. Why? To warn you. I liked you because of what Louis had told me. How did you know I'd be on that train? Don't you know that you've been watched ever since you set foot in New York? I have access to information that told what train you'd be on. And for telling you all this, I, I could be killed. I only ask that you believe me. I'd like to. Kit, we're not good for each other. Aren't we? No, for many reasons. But we may be able to help each other. Well, let's drop. Let's have some fun. I could use a big slice of it. <laughs> so could I. What about that dance you mentioned before? Wonderful. And then we'll really see the town. It's all right, Roman. It's just... All right, Anton. Now, come on. Talk. I said talk. Where's Roman? He, he isn't here. I'm sorry. You surprised me. I surprised you. That's swell. I was searching your apartment. Don't give me that. I want the truth. It's no good you're hitting me. I will tell only what I please. Come on. Let's have it. You are the one who should know that a man cannot be made to talk. 
You know that no matter what happened, if you talked, you would be killed. Is it not so? That is why they allowed you to escape. Allowed me to? Of course. So they let me escape. I should have thought of that. They couldn't beat it out of me and they couldn't kill me, so they'd wait. Is that it? All right. But they haven't got the standard. I've got it. I'm going to keep it. You can tell them that. They watched, maybe, but they slipped up because they didn't see where I hid it. Then it isn't in this country. It never was. Now get out and tell Ruman wherever he is, he'd better stay away from here. I may lose my temper, and I've been taught a lot of mean tricks. Get out, do you hear? Get out! No, it's not the way. Drinking won't help me. I've got to fight it out myself. I've got to find the man and kill him. And I've got to do it quickly. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, Mr. DeMille returns with Robert Young, Maureen O'Hara, and Walter Slezak for Act Three of The Fallen Sparrow. Meantime, way up in Maine, where they have those nice cold winters, two young mothers are chatting over the family mending basket. My Johnny's growing just like a weed. Mm-hmm, they all do at his age. Look at his snowsuit, absolutely bursting at the seams. And what a job getting a new one these days. Listen, Margaret. What, dear? An idea. My Davy outgrew his snowsuit last year. It's a lovely warm one, made of that nice soft blanket cloth, and packed away doing nobody any good. But aren't you saving it for little Sue? Oh, goodness. Johnny could wear it this winter and still have it good enough for Sue next year. You know I'll take good care of it. Just do what I do. Lux it now and then. Of course. Lux is wonderful. It makes such a difference in the way things wear. I'll really enjoy knowing Davy's suit is helping Johnny. It's an old American custom to share things, and we're doing more and more of it these days. Lux Flakes lends a helping hand in this, as millions of mothers know. These gentle flakes are so kind to fabrics, they keep baby things in the children's clothes like new longer. You can hand them down, share them when they're outgrown. So it pays to use Lux for sweaters, woolens, colored cottons. Yes, Lux care means longer wear, more chance to share. Don't worry if you find your dealer is out of Lux now and then. He'll have more soon. And Lux is worth waiting for. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. We'll get the latest news on our stars after the play. But now the curtain rises on the third act of The Fallen Sparrow, starring Robert Young, Maureen O'Hara, and Walter Slezak. I've got to find a man and kill him. And I've got to do it quickly. But John McKittrick was not quick enough. Early the next morning, he hears a shot in the next room. Half asleep, he stumbles out into the hall and into the body of his friend, Ab Parker. It's an hour later now. Inspector Tobin has arrived and is winding up what looks to him like just another very simple case. I understand Parker had been in Washington. When did he get back? I don't know. It must have been some time after I fell asleep. You got any ideas? Sure, Anton. Must have come back after I threw him out. And we checked on Anton right away. He didn't come back. He called up Parker's cousin, Whitney. Met her and Child, drank coffee. What did they talk about? Music. I've got something that somebody wants, Tobin. They've sent a guy after me. All I know about him is that he limps. What's that got to do with Parker's suicide? Suicide? Certainly. Gun was next to his body. You found it. Ab never committed suicide. Funny you're saying that. Might put your own pants right on the hot seat. Everything's suicide to you, Tobin. First Louie, now Ab. You figure this is tied up with Lepitino? Of course it is. Ab must have been doing some investigating. <clears throat> this uh, lame guy, why is he after you? He's after something I have. A battle standard. A what? A pennant, a flag. It belonged to my brigade in Spain. 
Ah, uh, so you expect me to believe you let a guy gun for you, let your friends be bumped off for some dopey pennant? Sure, it's a dopey pennant. You could buy one like it for five bucks. And Parker was killed because he knew about it, huh? Parker never even heard of it. Then why was he killed? I told you, because he was after out of Scott. Louis was after him, too. They both got bumped off. Nobody bumped off Louis. Don't you think the department takes care of its own men? Not too well. You going to hold me, Tobin? No. You go around yelling Parker was murdered, though, and you'll likely wind up on the chair. Remember that. Thanks, I will. Where's Whitney Parker now? Back home, I guess. Why? I'd like her to round up all those nice people we've been talking about. I want to throw a party for them tonight at the Club 50. Oh, uh, come along, if you like. Look, son, Louie told me you were in pretty bad shape when you came back from Spain. Maybe you're not yourself yet. Just forget about flags and people who aren't there and people getting murdered. Who are you covering, Tobin? Uh... Hello, Bobby. Sorry I'm late. Oh, you're not the only one. Dr. Scoss and Elma haven't shown up either. Where are the others? Whitney, Anton, and Otto in Jake's office. Come on, let's go in. Wait a minute. This is ghastly about Ab. It couldn't have happened. Kid, I have to tell you... Ab and I were engaged. <laughs> Wonderful. When you came back, he didn't want to hold me to it. But I had to pretend I couldn't hurt him. So he leaves town and you and Otto go skiing. You should have been in Spain, sweetheart. Why? Anything for a thrill. Is that why you went? Why not? Sort of alike. Except I don't think I'm quite the hypocrite you are. Just what do you mean by that? Now, skip it. Here comes Miss Don. Come on, let's go in. Well, there's no point talking anymore. Seems I've made a fool of myself. I had a hunch. I thought I might be able to tell you something. The hunch didn't pan out. Sorry. I'm glad that uh, Dr. Scott couldn't come. It would have been a pity to have dragged him down here for nothing. Why couldn't he come, Elmo? The doctor and I were both at the hospital. He wanted to stay with my grandfather. Well, we know one thing anyway. Regardless of what the police say, we're all certain Ab didn't shoot himself. That's right, Whitney. Can't we find out what Ab was working on? If we were to go through his papers... I had we'd... some understanding of codes, Mr. McKittrick. If there should be any among Mr. Parker's effects, perhaps I could be of some service. I'd be very grateful for a chance to help. Thank you, Otto. Great many Norwegians have found opportunities to help. I know what you are hinting. I should be in uniform, but I cannot leave my uncle. He is a helpless cripple. I'm sorry. Anton, how about you? Any ideas? I'm afraid this is all far beyond me. Well, then I guess that's that. Shall we go to the bar? Uh, but uh, first, I have a present for Elmer. I'd like you all to see it. It's a medallion. The Lion of San Rafael. The most beautiful thing I own. For the most beautiful girl I know. Where did you get that? I uh, picked it up in Spain. You brought it back with you from there? I sent it back. Smuggled it in. In a seashell. What kind of a joke is that? No joke, the truth. Will you wear it for me, Elma? I'm sorry, but I can't. Why not? It's lovely. More than you brought me, kid. Oh, you must not refuse it, Elma. The prince would not object to your accepting it, I'm sure. Very well. Thank you, kid. You'll wear it? Yes, I wear it. Kid, would you mind taking me home? <laughs> you can drop the act now, kid. Why did you give me this? So everybody'd see it? Do you want to be killed? Not especially. But I intend to find the man who limps. Kit, please take it back. I want you to wear it. When I said you're the most beautiful girl I know, I meant it. I could have said more, Alma. Oh, I wanted to be. I've meant everything I've said to you. Thank you. So have I. Please take me home. <laughs> I asked you to come to headquarters, McKittree, because I wanted to tell you that Louis Lepetino didn't fall from a window in the Tabaton Library. You mean that? Yeah. Why didn't you say so before? Because I knew what you went through in Spain. But I didn't know how well you were snapping out of it. I couldn't take a chance on your breaking. Tell me about Louis. Well, his real job was for the government. He was after an espionage ring. He was pushed from a window, yes, but first he'd been shot. As a rule, we don't do an autopsy after that sort of a fall. This time we did. We found the bullet. What about Ab Parker? He was working on the same thing. You were right, of course. He was murdered. 
Say, uh, about that flag of yours, have you talked to the Federals about it? No. It's a personal matter between me and a little man in Berlin. The brigade I was with picked off one of his favorite generals, an old pal from the beer hall days. He swore he'd have every last man in our outfit and our flag to hang in Berchtesgarten. I swore he wouldn't. Oh. But Louis, Inspector, what brought him to the Scoss's room that night? You got the tip from your girlfriend, Elma Don. Well, now that you mention it, she phoned me a little while ago. Anton's giving a recital tonight at her house. I'm going. You've got men working on this, haven't you, Tobin? A few? Well, call them off for 24 hours. I think I can wind it up if you do. Otherwise, there might be a slip. They've got too many mice. What are you going to do? The guy I'm after is going to open up tonight. I'm going to force him to. Listen, McKit, but you go around plugging anyone, you're going to answer for it. Is it deal? Yeah, I'm a sap. Yeah, go on, get going. Oh, Kid, I'm so glad you're here. I have so much to say to you and so little time. And, uh, did the medallion do its job? Yes, and I'm sick to death of the thought of what might happen to you. I'm terribly afraid for you, Kit. What earthly good do you think it does you to hold out? Do you think it's heroic? Well, it isn't. It's, it's senseless. It's childish. Listen to me. No, you listen. A flag, a little piece of cloth, a dirty rag you wouldn't stop to pick up if you saw it on the street. And you're willing to... Oh, oh Kit, Kit. <laughs> There's some things a guy just has to do. doesn't matter what you think about it or how afraid you are. What else makes a man stand up against a tank with only a rifle in his hand? Why do they hide in the hills when their army's gone and keep plugging away when they know their people will be butchered in retaliation? Something they just can't help. That flag is a symbol to me, reminding me of 3,000 men who were my friends. 3,000 guys who were shot down around me. Before I let that little man put his filthy hands on it, I'll go like Louis and Ab did. Kit, I've loved peace and right, too. All my life, and I've loved little things. Things that were important to me. The house we had in the village, children growing up, and now I have nothing to love except you. And that was over before it ever began. Why do you say that? Because I'm helpless. You think they've got you, too? No, they haven't. You're coming with me. I can't. You've got to make a choice soon, darling, tonight. I will, kid, but later on, later. Will you do something else for me? Yes. In a little while, arrange to get me upstairs. I want to have a look at Dr. Scott's room. Will you do that? I'll try to get up. Too bad the prince is not here, Mr. McKittrick. When I left him at the hospital, he said he was very flattered you so admired his goblet. He asked that we drink his health. Good. I like his wine. Here, then. To his highness. Right. Oh, uh, uh, this way. What are you doing? Just switching the glasses. You take mine, I take yours. Old boys are custom, doctor. <laughs> oh, yes, your joke. <laughs> drink up, doctor. To his highness. Ah, my favorite composition. You mind wheeling me inside to the study, please? Good music should be listened to in solitude. Kit. Yes? Where did you take Dr. Scott? To his study. Then go up those stairs, the first door to the left. And hurry, Kit, please hurry. Done, Mr. McKittrick? Well, why do you not shoot? Dr. Scars. I have left my wheelchair. Scars. I shall walk over to you. You shall not shoot me. Watch, Mr. McKittrick. And listen. Put your gun away. Sure. I'm not afraid of you, Doctor. Seeing you is all I needed. 
Neither of us will do any killing. I cannot kill you because you have information I must obtain. You cannot kill me because you lack the brutality. That and scolorodine. Scolorodine? You drank a quantity a little while ago in your wine. I hate to stoop to such melodrama, but it seemed the only certain way. Of course, I assumed you would switch the goblets again. Scolorodine is a drug that destroys the will. Already you're trembling. In a few, few minutes, you will be completely helpless. Meanwhile, we shall talk. Yes? Yeah. Otto killed Louis Leptino. Yes, Otto does pretty well what he's told. Where's Otto now, Doctor? Shall I tell you? Danny has him. Danny? Yeah. Danny works for Louis's brother. Too bad. The fortunes of war. But uh, Otto didn't kill Ab Parker. No, I killed him. I sent him a telegram, signed your name. But it didn't come at the time we expected. So I remained hidden while you had your little engagement with Anton. Then you went to bed. Parker came home. I shot him. As simple as that. I went out the back way. Ruman made the arrangements, Mr. McKittrick. Yes? The drug will soon cause you to collapse. And then, as consciousness returns, you will have things to tell me. Things that I... Oh. So soon, Mr. McKittrick? It is effective even quicker than I... Kit. I just shot Dr. Scott. No. Gave me a drug. I don't know how long it'll take. Quickly, Alma, I must know. Where does the prince fit in all this? Kit, you've got to get out of here. No. Danny brought friends, Jake's men. They're all around the house. I told them to get Anton and call the cops. I asked you about the prince. He's not your grandfather, is he? No. He thinks they're going to make him king of France. He's dying now in the hospital. But you, you... I had to do what they ordered me. I married the real Otto Scott. He died in a concentration camp. I have a daughter three years old. She's in Germany, held as a hostage. Alma, you told me that you loved me. Did you mean that? Yes, but it's no use, Kit. They'll kill my child. Well, there are ways to get her out, underground ways. No, I'm not brave, Kit. I love, and for those I love, I do what I can. You're not afraid. I'll help you. There are ways, many ways. I love you, Elma. You'll have time to forget me, Kit, when I'm gone. If you'll only let me go. Don't say no. We'll meet somewhere and... The police will be coming soon, Kit. Will you do what I say? Yes, but the answer will always be the same. Then hurry now, quickly. Get to Chicago. Change your name and get a room in the West Side Hotel. I'll square it here, and, and, and when it's safe, I'll join you. Oh, my darling, darling. Hey, McKittrick. McKittrick. You all right? Yeah. I guess so. Well, where am I? Hospital. Doc's been working on you. Fell for a Mickey, huh? Yeah. How long have I been under? A couple of hours. You shot Scott? Yeah. Maybe it was self-defense? Maybe it was. Well, it'll be up to the Federals. You better not talk now, son. Wait a minute. Anton? Yeah, we got him. Auto, too. Good work. And, uh, the girl? She slipped away. I don't quite understand how. Oh, I let her go, Tobin. She... She helped me. You think this will stop with the ones we've got? What about that flag? It's hidden in Lisbon. If I don't have to stand trial, I'm going over there. I'm going to give it to some boys who can use it. There'll be brigades forming again. Uh, maybe. You sure about that girl? I don't know, but maybe we can... Well, forget it now, son. Go on. Go to sleep. Passengers will please board the plane. Departure is in ten minutes. Passengers will please board the plane. Hello, Elma. Kit. They found me not guilty. I knew they would. So did Tobin. Who? Inspector Tobin. He also suggested that I come to, uh, down here right away instead of going to Chicago. Funny I should meet you on a clipper ready to take off for Lisbon. I thought we had a date in Chicago. I had to do it this way, Kit. Believe me, I have to go back and find my little girl. 
I wish there had been a little girl. I wish you told me the truth. You're going back to the Nazis. Kit, you've got to trust me. You got your passport and your permit for the Clipper through the German consul. I didn't find that out. Tobin did. Waiting for you, Elma. Come on. No, you, you can't. You... Come on. This way, Miss Dawn. There's some federal men to see you. Sorry, Kit. Believe me. That's all according to how you look at it. Another sparrow falls. Follow. Our stars will return for a curtain call in just a moment. Now, Sally says there's one question that's practically guaranteed to make a woman mad. That is if she knows anything about housekeeping. It's this. Do you work or just keep house? If it didn't make you so mad, you'd probably be flattered. Because if you can run your house, do the cooking and cleaning and dishwashing, without looking as though you did a lot of honest-to-goodness work, you're pretty smart. I'll lay you a little bit, Sally, that smart women like that have a few beauty secrets, like... Like Lux for dishes? You're right, Mr. Kennedy. Most women know that with Lux flakes in the dishpan, your hands stay as lovely and smooth as if you were a lady of pre-war leisure. And even if they've grown red and rough from strong dishwashing soaps, they'll soon regain their natural loveliness if you change to gentle Lux Flakes. In actual tests, women with rough, red dishpan hands found their hands improving in just two to seven days. These women used no cream or lotions on their hands. They just changed to Lux. And don't overlook this fact. Lux is thrifty for dishes. It goes further. Yes, you can change dishpan hands to Lux hands. For less than a penny a day. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our star. 